hello, everybody, and welcome to the Illuminati Podcast, episode 49, the long-awaited and the long-toiled-on Skinwalker Ranch, part two. Also, it's just long. Yeah. Like, in general, it's just long. <laughs> yeah, 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 I guess so. Yeah, it's just long. Uh, I have you... Hey, well, I, let me get the intros out of the way. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by my two co-hosts, Alex Fasciani and Jesse Cox. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hey. I've been talking all Every day Every day is the same. Every day is the Time same. Time has no meaning. Time ha- you're right. Time has no meaning right now. I'm doing, I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good. Right every day. <laughs> <laughs> I had some shishito peppers. Uh, I'm good. I'm yeah, feeling good. I just went from doing, I jumped from doing five hours of D&D right to this. So my, just, my voice is like, it's going to die on me. Be ready. I'm not I'm sure high. how well we're going to It could last. be worse. But you know, I'm excited. <laughs> and true, it could it be, be worse. worse. It could be worse. I could keep talking about Skinwalker Ranch Part 2, which I am super thrilled to talk about. But first, I got to hand it over to our local shill, Alex Vassiani. <laughs> yeah, guys, Alex. listen, here's the deal. This show is supported by a website, a wonderful website called Patreon. It's a great site, does a lot for creators, and in this time, nothing is more consistent than a monthly paycheck that we can count on to keep this ship of ours afloat. And you are the crew. So please, come to patreon.com slash chaluminatipod. And you... who signs up gets to clean the toilets. And the last one is a rotten egg. (laughs) And don't be the egg, because if you're the egg... Then you're what never going to know whether what or not is, the chicken what? comes first. Life's oldest mystery, Chiluminati, Chiluminati podcast. What? Check it out. $15 what? gets you what? $15 a month gets you 15 <laughs> minutes of extra Chiluminati podcast every single month. You. 15 minutes is not the right. Actually, it, way did I say, more. Did I say 15 minutes? More. I said, I meant 15 minutes, like the yeah, last it was episode. 50 minutes for the last one. Yeah. It was a 50 minute small app. Uh, what? Yeah, what a value. What a value, value, I say. And there's all kinds of different tiers there. If you want something small, you can get like the $10 tier or the $5 tier, $1 tier. But y'all get little behind the scenes things like the show notes, uh, the scripts after they're finished up, the extra shows, all kinds of goodies. So go check it out. We thank you so much for your support. Jesse, it's time. It's time. And I know I know, I call you out every time. But for episode one, you know, that was the history for you. That was the lay of the land, the history of the world and the, and the native Ute people and what happened to them. In that particular basin, because today, yeah, I know it seemed pretty factual. You guys can't, the rails, you guys, but like, you guys can't see it. But J- Mathis is making the face that Doc Brown, <laughs> Doctor so Emmett Brown, made to Marty McFly right before. <laughs> so to give you, he flew into the air in his DeLorean for the first time. <laughs> well, we're you... going. We don't need roads. <laughs> yeah, I... Exactly. Okay. Uh, to give you an idea, this is episode two. The the outlines that we were using for episode two. I only got about 50% of episode two outline in in episode two before I was like, I got to stop because we're just going to go on forever. So this is likely going to be a four parter. Um, But episode two is going to be focusing on the main family, the family that we talked about in episode one, the one that moved in in 1994, the one that took the land off of those, that weird couple that had it from the fifties. We're going to be talking all about that. And particularly two of the most common encounters that they had during their little over a year there. And uh, maybe a few more of the smaller ones, but there's some other ones we're going to save for the next episode as well. So, Jesse, I need you to open your mind, allow yourself... Mind open. Allow yourself to be taken on a ride of unbelievability. and believe, I have no choice. And believe as best you can. Yeah, I mean, I won't guarantee that. Two out of three ain't bad, though. That's, you know what? That is a majority, and I'll take it. Alex, yeah. I feel like you're already on... We're on the same page, at least. For I'm just excited for what comes next. I'm the Here guy who go. liked the end of Lost. You know what I mean? Like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm ready. Well, the Gorman family story on Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> I'm just going to go into it. The Gorman family story. How dare you. On- <laughs> <laughs> that show deserved better. It did I loved it. You. So much better. I it loved it. It deserved a better ending. Me and the guy who wrote the show agree. I promise. <laughs> he did. You and Damon Lindelof. Yeah, me like and Damon. Shout out to buns. Damon. I bet he listens. <laughs> you rascal. Come with me, boys. It's time. The Gorman family story on Skinwalker Ranch begins in 1994 after they had purchased it from the previous owners that had possessed the ranch since the 1950s. Did you use that term because it, like, reminds me of, like, a ghost? Ooh, maybe. Maybe I'm they just bringing out my ranch. creative Come writer, on. you know? Yeah. I'll never tell you my secrets. I'll okay. Never. Uh, but as we covered in the first episode, this is the same couple in the 50s that had the ranch up until then. They never, ever lived on the ranch, always lived off-site, and only ever visited the ranch once a year to do a property check. 
The Gorman family themselves were a relatively standard Midwestern family of the area at the time, meaning two very specific things. One, they were Mormons, though they weren't actively all that practicing since they had they lived ranch life. They're and two, chill Mormons. Huh? Chill Mormons. They were very chill Mormon. Uh, and two, it, it also meant that they were living like the rancher lifestyle. They had uh, That's where they made most of their money, as we'll learn about. And for this particular family, there were five members that lived on the ranch. That and Those are the ones that we'll be focusing on, obviously, today. First, there was Tom Gorman. He was the father, an experienced rancher, specializing in high-quality, cemental and black Angus show cattle. Essentially, the dude knew his cows really well. He knew how to make a buck off of them. His wife, Ellen Gorman, was known to be, quote, highly intelligent with a natural business sense. During this time on the ranch, she worked at a mortgage office, not too far out into town. They also had two children that lived with them, Tad and Kate. They both would help out with ranch work on the, on the ranch itself, and they were both known to be straight-A students in school. And finally, there was Ed Gorman. That was Tom's father, the patriarch of the family, the grandfather to the children, and he was the one that taught the entire family the cattling lifestyle. He was the one that raised his son with it and, and passed it on, so on. But the Gorman family was a cattle family through and through. To put it into perspective and how much pride that they took in their work at the time, most of their neighbors and other ranchers were totally fine taking about a 5% loss of their herd through the year, through to weather, wildlife, bad fencing, whatever. While the Gormans were devastated if they came anywhere near 1% lost of their herd. All of this to say that ranching was basically their blood and they weren't people who did not know what they were doing. These are people who moved into the ranch and knew ex very much the lifestyle that they were going to live. They were not strangers to it. At the time of the ranch purchase in 1994, the ranch itself was around 480 acres of cottonwood trees, Russian olive trees, and rolling pasture land that was bordered by a creek. If you headed up north toward the north of the property, the border there was an irrigation canal and a northern border of a 200-foot ridge of red rock and mud that would eventually become known as Skinwalker Ridge, which we talked about a little bit in the first episode. And it's an important note that when it rains out there, that the ridge and the canal become impossibly muddy to traverse, just too much for anybody to try and push through. All this is obviously uh, kind of give you an idea as to the layout of the ranch. And you can actually get a sky picture of the ranch itself to kind of give yourself uh, to, to really like map out the area if that's something you're interested in. I'm imagining that it looks like Bowser's face, like Mario Kart or something. <laughs> it's just seeing it from the sky. It's just a chomping 2D yeah. Mar uh, Bowser face. For me, like I actually picture more along the lines of like your stereotypical JRPG farm that your yeah. protagonist starts on. And then the world starts to fall apart and they realize they're the chosen one and you go off on your adventure. Except this time, instead of having a world ending event, you have Bigfoots, interdimensional Bigfoots protecting the family from otherworldly disasters. Just think about how scary that must have been <laughs> back then. Jesse's jaw opened and his eyes rolled twice. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm on the adventure. Keep taking I'm, me. I'm still taking before you. Before I get off hand, this ride. We're only taking baby steps so far, Jesse. Do not worry. I know. I'm aware because you've been talking about how they were good ranchers which i believe has nothing to do with the rest of this well for some of the things that they run into you'd think a rancher might be able to understand and they don't. those were some very specific statistics about lost sure. livestock I'm just sure, sure. yes yes it's very specific now while one might assume that like most people who move into a quote-unquote haunted or strange area that you might be you begin to assume that it's a slow ramp up you little things begin to happen and as time goes on they become more and more intense it's like a movie the, yeah yeah like the movie and how a lot of stories go a lot of poltergeist activity uh acts that way instead but but instead for this particular family it all started almost right away kind of weirdly actually within the contract itself there was a little strangeness right at the purchase the contract for the purchase had bizarre clauses in it one such clause that was made known is that even after purchase and taking it from the couple, no digging was to be done on the property unless that couple was notified first. Like if there was like oil or something there and they... Could be, could be. We don't <clears throat> know. It's just the, the, the clause of the contract was no digging unless they are able to get permission from or notify the other, but previous owners first. No digging? Mm-hmm. The you have to call the owner who owned it before, even though Clear you own it, it now. Correct. Very bizarre. 
very bizarre clause to have in the contract of a, of a ranch that you're purchasing. Moreover, the ranch itself looked really bizarre. Like it was prepped for an attack of some sort or was like prepped to, to weather a storm or some weird thing. The windows what were- Whoa, what is that? Yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, I'm gonna go through to it. Yeah, 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 I'm not okay. just gonna say that's it. I was like, what are you talking about? Every one of the windows were bolted shut on this ranch house. Moreover, every single door in the house had heavy duty deadbolts on both sides of the door. And at the end of the farmhouse, there were large metal rings that they believed but weren't sure as they would have to be very large dogs, but were believed to ostensibly chain up possibly guard dogs. But the Gorman family wasn't able to tell that for sure. They don't know. But they never used this ranch? Correct, exactly. There's no, they never used the ranch. They had a few workers that tended to it occasionally, but nobody lived on it. Like the owners didn't live on the ranch and yet the ranch was built and, and is like windows bolted, doors bol dead bolts on both sides. All kinds of weird, weird, weird stuff. And the MIG metal rings at the end of the property for potentially guard dogs, but nobody really knows. Even if there's weird clauses in the contract, however, it wasn't enough to ward off the Gormans. Would that be enough to ward you off? Out of curiosity. Don't dig? Yeah, if, 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 like, say that's the only weird clause, but the clause in the contract is, listen, you just can't dig unless you run a bias first. I know you own the property, but that's the clause. What do they, can they do? Like, can they, like, sue you? I genuinely don't know because I'm not a lawyer. I don't know, like, if that's even something that could be held up in court. I'm just uh, wondering. I'm not, it's such a weird thing to want to know. It's one of those things for me to be like, oh, so you were serial killers? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you think yeah. you can dig up bodies or something. What do you mean I can't dig up on my own well, property? Well, because even, even if you're buying it to, to dig on, right? Even sure. if you want to drill for oil on this land, which, like, maybe, you know, yeah, based you on what you, you said last time. You can justify it in that way, yeah. Right? Like, why... Like, why would you sell it? Like, under what pretense would you sell it where you're like, but I don't want you digging for oil or else I want to charge more? Yeah, you know I don't what I mean? know. It's very, it, very, It doesn't very weird. even really make sense in that way. Yeah, it's bizarre. Uh, <laughs> none of this, however, was enough to ward off the Gorman families from moving in either way. And despite a previously, uh, a bizarre previous owner who seemed mostly detached from their property beyond the strange clauses, the ranch itself was perfect for their ranching way of life and getting right into it was their hope. As we'll find, however, those hopes would be dashed almost immediately. If you want to read along, our main source for this particular episode is going to be Hunt for the Skinwalker, as it's really the, the book that kind of a company uh, that addresses all of the family's claims. We're going to be going through and talking about some of their claims. We can't talk about all of their claims because there are just too many. So we've picked out our favorites and we're going to split them over this episode and next. And we're going to talk about obviously all of them. But just for those who want to read along, Hunt for the Skinwalker is the main source for this episode in particular. Now, you said that this family's not actually called the Gorman family, right? Correct. Their real name, I believe, is out there. However, I don't know for sure if that's what they want. So in the I, book, are they referred to as the Gormans? They are referred to as the Gormans in the book. Interesting. Okay. So that is how I'm going to refer to them from now on just to be safe. But... The name is out there. I know the name. You can find the name. And if you have any interest, you could look it up. I don't even know if it's all that private anymore. Is yep. it actually their first names? That I am actually not sure of off the top of my head. He simply says the names are changed for the, you know, for their what have you. Sure. Uh, their privacy. So the first sighting would be the one that set the tone for, in my opinion, almost every sighting from here on out. One night. Shortly after that, the family moved onto the property. Tom, Ed, and Ellen were outside enjoying the night and having a chat with one another. After some time chatting, all three of them saw a large a figure bounding across their open field in the distance. After a little examination from the three of them, they all determined it was probably nothing more than a large wolf. There was very little time for them to react, however before the wolf who was bounding across the field changed direction and moved directly toward the family instead. Ed Gorman claims the wolf came up to his chest, and we'll keep in mind that Ed is about six feet tall. He says uh, the shoulders of the wolf are at his, at his like, The wolf comes pecs? up to his, to his like, Oh, to his I thought chest. you meant, they, like, the wolf literally went up to his chest. You mean height-wise. Actually, both. We're getting there. Oh, boy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the wolf in height came up to his chest, uh, and, and Ed is about six feet tall. The wolf, however, didn't stop by just approaching them. 
It walked directly in front of them and up to them. And it threw the family off. This was very bizarre and not natural behavior for what they've seen before wildlife. First, it wasn't acting like a wild animal of any sort, showing a strange sense of curiosity toward the family. Moreover, Ed claims to have felt a weird feeling of calm exuding from the creature, so much so that Ed felt 100% comfortable reaching out and petting this thing for a little while, eventually asking and bringing the others to also come and pet it. Ellen, however, refused. There would be no... Effing way in hell! Fight. If I was the wife, I would be like, no! <laughs> yeah, no, no way! What are you doing? Don't you take my kids towards that wolf! <laughs> it's insane. To their description, the wolf itself had silver gray fur and light blue eyes. That feeling of exuding, exuding calm wouldn't last, however, as the strangeness of this creature would continue. Is it okay if I imagine Richard Gere instead of a wolf? Please do, actually. <laughs> He's just on all fours, just yeah. naked. Yeah, like chomping. Ansel Elgort. <laughs> I still would be like, don't you go near Richard Gere. <laughs> no! He's naked, leave him alone. <laughs> He's clearly lost and confused. As I said, the feeling of calm would not last, and the strangeness of this creature just would push forward. In an instant, that calm feeling dissipated and instead was replaced with a sense of unease. The wolf no longer seemed interested in the family, but its attention had been snapped in a different direction and been brought over to the corral, where a couple of prized Angus calves had been recently unloaded, and one calf had stuck its head through the bars in curiosity. The other calf, was clearly the brain here of the two, was hiding at the back of the corral at this point. The wolf, ignoring the family, bounded over to the corral and grabbed the calf by the head, violently slamming the calf's body into the metal bars over and over again as it attempted to pull the calf through the locked doors. And yeah, that's how animals work. <laughs> the calf screamed uh, ridiculously, and so, reactively, Tom ran over, and he began to kick the wolf over and over again oh with God. his boot, shouting at the thing to let it go. But the wolf completely ignored him, and continued to tug on the calf as the wails of the calf became desperate. This, have you, have the two of you seen Tiger King yet? No, yeah. I refuse. I don't want to be sad. <laughs> this is like the entire time he's like, they're a beautiful, majestic beast. I love them. Cut to the one clip for me like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Pulling yeah. a gun on a tiger. <laughs> Get yeah. the fuck away from me or I'll shoot you in the, between the goddamn eyes. This is that yeah. where they're like, this majestic creature walked up to us and like, get away from her, you son of a bitch. It ripped her head off of my baby cow. <laughs> but Tom, Tom, look, it's so pretty. I can pet it. <laughs> now you got to shoot you between the goddamn eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so as the calf is dying, as it's trying to be- It's an animal. Yeah, of course. He runs over to this thing and begins to kick it, shouting at it for it to let it go. But he was ignored. So Tom shouted over his shoulder for someone to bring him his th a .357 Magnum. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He levied the barrel at the creature, leveled oh the barrel at the creature, and fired four shots into this thing. Into the wolf. Into Directly into the wolf. After the third Shh. shot, it let go of the calf's head. And on the fourth shot, it began to walk off. With clear gunshot wounds, the wolf showed no signs of injury in its movement or the way it acted. No fear, nor any blood. Still not finished. Tom then shouted for his 30 aught six. Was his second <laughs> nearby? Who yeah. <laughs> like waiting in the well, wings? The family's with his... behind him. They keep their weapons out, I guess. <laughs> They're like his party members. They're like carrying his shit. Yeah, you got it, Tom. You got Two-handed sword. Tom? Attend me. <laughs> his, his second nearby. <laughs> Holy shit. That is a great... <laughs> that's a great visual. I just can see a guy sitting there with his box, holding <laughs> holding his musket in a box. Magnum! <laughs> blim, 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 blim! 30 off six. Shotgun! <laughs> oh, God. tears coming out of my eyes, dude. Um, then the wolf... So his skin, like, there was, like, metal, and it filled back in the wounds, and then it turned into <laughs> Robert Patrick, and he started running, and his hands turned into knives. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. <laughs> um, so Tom, shouting for his 30-06, was handed it, 
and then he shot the wolf two damn more times. The wolf, with flesh actually being ripped off of its body, simply trotted off, unimpressed with what was happening, no longer interested. Tad, one of his boys, grabbed the magnum his father had replaced with Ah, his second. (laughs) Tad, no! It was Tad. Tad grabbed the magnum that his father had replaced while Tom, Tom hung on to his rifle, and they chased after the wolf. Why on earth would they chase this invincible death wolf? <laughs> well, I mean, think about it, dude. You just unloaded six shots into this thing. Flesh is careening off of it, and it just is like, eh, I'm bored. I'm going to leave. Flesh is careening. Yeah. I would be like, whoa. I would be like, whoa, Tad. We are lucky to get away with our lives. Let's go home and have supper now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that line is surprisingly on brand for what happens in the minute. Okay. So, Tad grabs the magnum, Tom hangs on to his, to his gun, and they go chasing off after the wolf. There was no blood to follow. No blood had come out of it, and it wasn't bleeding. But what the time cre- is it? Sorry? What time is it? This is like night. They're like at nighttime. Uh, okay. All right. All right. It's fine. Uh. Moreover, the creature, le- the creature left inch-deep tracks and was still incredibly easy for them to follow, even through the Russian olive trees where it actually went off to. M- more than just the tracks, they could also catch blurs of, the- of silver leading them through the woods, always just within sight, but never catchable. It, it felt as though they claim in the book that it was just leading them, like toying with them, always blurs just out of sight. Blurs of silver? But, yeah, it moved in a weird speed. But was they were always able to keep up with it. It looked like it was moving fast, but it was so never. So they're out saying of sight. this is the wolf. This is the wolf they're okay. chasing. They believe to be chasing the wolf here. However, once they reached the creek, the track stopped completely, and with no way to track the thing, they went back to their ranch. Tom looked to his son on their way back and said, Look, son, I can't explain what happened. I'm not gonna <laughs> even try. Let's just forget that this ever happened and have a meal in town. There you go. That's with what his, we're talking about. Ed, Tad, and with, come on. With his father actually taking charge and kind of laying that, Tad says that he felt a sense of comfort knowing that his dad was at least taking charge because he could not also comprehend what was happening there. That, just a scary night with a wolf. liquored up in town. Yeah, let's just go drink this thing off. Scarynightwithawolf.com. A few days later, however, a small bit of information would come forward that allowed the Gormans to accept what they saw and write it off as nothing more than a wolf. One of their neighbors claimed that they had a large pack of wolves that lived on their land. And according to the Gormans, that was plenty enough for them to just say, it was a wolf, I don't want to deal with it anymore. They're like, oh, or it was oh you guys werewolves. got invincible wolves? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah, ran yeah. into an invincible wolf last night. I shot six bullets into it. <laughs> Actually, four bullets and two shotgun shells. However... That would not be the only wolf sighting that would happen. But uh, before we move on to this wolf, the more wolf stuff, large creature encounters were something that happened regularly on Skinwalker Ranch. And we will talk about a couple of others next episode. For now, we're going to stick with the wolf. As I said, this would not be the only wolf sighting the family would have. After having moved into the new ranch, Ellen, as we said, was in need of a job. And so she found one at a mortgage office in town that she would commute to and work in. One day, on her way home from work, Ellen claims to have seen a wolf similar to the one that they saw on their property. It was so large that it stood tall enough for its head to actually be over the car when it stood. Like and her car on was a gray on four shimmer. legs, on like four a dire legs, wolf? as it stood on four like le- a giant ass beast. Yes, like it stood on four legs and its head was over the car. Did it look vengeful? Impossible. What was she in? Like a, a gray Metro? Chivette. What the hell? A gray <laughs> Whatever the hell that is. <laughs> she was in a. She was in like a like a Dodge Dart. A unicycle. Yeah, yeah Dodge like Dart a Fiat. A yeah. Like, what the hell kind of car was she in? <laughs> Bigger she, than the car? I do not in believe. In This sighting was just so you know. This sighting happened about a half a mile before she was home. About half a mile outside of Skinwalker Ranch. Was it in another car, and that's why it is like... <laughs> no. Was it on a motorcycle? How is it bigger than a car? It was standing on the side of the road, and it was just taller than her vehicle. Was there no one else out there? There you was one giant... other thing out there, actually. Another canine. An all-black dog that she claims had a head too big for its body, but still not quite as big as the wolf that was there. 
What a oh, weird... that's like the training montage where like the one guy is learning to become a wolf and they're like, your head's too big. And he's like, I'm trying. He's like, you see that, son? It. That's the face of the woman who we're going to kill tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the dog in the background. Oh, boy, daddy, I'm just so yeah. hungry. Yeah. Uh, so after seeing those wolves, she slammed on the gas and just rushed home. She then r- further reported the sighting to the tribal office in town. But they explained to her that there were no wolves in Utah, and the last one had been shot in 1929. In this, that, no one would ever say there are no wolves in Utah. Well, this actually in the whole does, state. No, no, this actually tracks because the following year, Utah, it, it, no, in the is Mormon. <laughs> and wolves hate Mormons. <laughs> no, they were it all killed. Tracks. They were all shot, but. Uh, in 1995, the following year, they would actually transplant a pack of gray wolves into central Idaho. And those wolves, that pack would grow so f- big that they would then migrate to Utah over the years. And Utah would then have a resurgence in, in a wolf population. But this happened the year after. Like, Idaho didn't get their wolves until a year after all of these events happened. So you the know office who- suggested that she saw coyotes, but Ellen vehemently denies it. So but she also said it was the size of a car. So <laughs> yeah. the person that I would be on right now is that neighbor who was like, I have a pack of wolves on my property. Right. right. Yeah. Cause there's just conflicting information. I would be calling them and be like, who the fuck are you? What are you doing? <laughs> Tell me about the invincible wolf children. <laughs> the invincible wolf children. In 1963, <laughs> I had an affair with a wolf. <laughs> And those right are my wolf moon. children. <laughs> just as the mother was being eaten by a werewolf, she had her babies. <laughs> Oh, God. Well, that wraps up the wolf encounter. One of the many. Does it? Yes. This, what? This wraps up the wolf encounters. We will talk more about large animals that are seen. But in timeline and sticking with the timeline, other things. After that whole thing, that was the last time they had a big wolf encounter. And instead, other things began to happen around the ranch as well. Well, at least, now, at least she got Jesse, a sense of closure. Exactly right. At least she got that they should use coyotes. They were like, "That wasn't real. That was coyotes." Forget what you saw. It wasn't real. Exactly. Now, Jesse, I know we said in episode one. Remember, everything we've ever talked about on Shaluminati is going to come around. It's true. Oh, we're we're about to move into something else. A couple of other things, in fact. I can't wait to see how this all fits together. If a bizarre wolf-like cryptid wasn't enough, the Gormans also began to experience typical minor haunting-like events. That same year, Ellen Gorman was taking a walk in what is now known as Skinwalker Ridge. And while she was walking, she felt a large object rush by her, followed and accompanied by a rush of wind that would accompany something large moving fast behind it. Naruto. Right, it was probably Naruto. Yeah. Uh, But when she turned around, there was nothing there. That reminds me of the... Maybe it was just the wolf running really quickly. It's possible. It was a blur of silver. with that in mind, within the house itself things also suddenly started to get weird. Small things started to go missing. Kitchen implements, Tom's tools, books, brushes, etc. Drawers would be left open, cabinets swung open. Occasionally, they would be found in entirely different parts of the home. Other times, they would return to where they were missing from in the first place, and some just never were found at all. All of this lining up with what is what is typical in the beginnings of poltergeist-like activity in a place of living or home or town. But, much like everything and every other occurrence on this farm, things would only stay minor for a very short while. In 1994, the Gorman's nephew, Dave, came to visit the Gormans on their ranch for an extended stay. Dave was a city kid and only 14 years old. He was sent out to get some, quote, hard work under his belt, unquote. (laughs) Never worked a day in his life. His yeah, hands were never soft worked a day in his life. as a baby's was... bottom. <laughs> My kind of man, more or less. <clears throat> and the Gormans were fully intent on making him, at the very least, a competent ranch hand by the end. Just goddamn it, Dave. They just wanted him to be at least, like, do the basics. Repair fence, you know, herd the cattle, the basic stuff. But poor old Dave wouldn't even make it to the end of his trip before he decided he was getting the hell out of here. Oh, I thought he died. I was like, oh, my God. He was, his head was bitten off by a wolf whose head was too big for his body. And he never played another PC game again. Poor Dave. Never lived his full nerd life. 
For starters, Dave was scared of the dark. Terrified, in fact, and refused to do any work after sundown. And since Dave was so scared of the dark, Tom and Tad decided to take him out on a property check around dusk while the sun was still at least somewhat up and there was sunlight that still spilled onto their property. The three men were making their rounds when Tom said he saw what looked like an RV on his land. Not having any trespasses, or rather not wanting to have any trespasses on their land, Tom went toward the RV to tell them to leave and chase them off. Maybe some kids parked in a, an abandoned ranch that's never seen to, you know, F around or have a good time or something completely different. The mystery Drink, machine drinking. was there. Yeah, mystery machine, they're there. There, they finally are there, Scooby-Doo and the gang. But Didn't as he approached I the RV. Having sex. What? <laughs> what? Sorry, what? Nothing. Oh, oh that's okay. just mystery machine. Hashtag yeah, shaggy smoke weed, spread the word. <laughs> uh, as the three men continued to give uh, as they uh, rather as Tom approached the RV began to drive away and away from Tom so the three men decided to give chase and continued to give chase to the vehicle to get the people off of their property when they realized something very peculiar there was no driver <laughs> no no a Weimariner was driving the car <laughs> it was actually the wolf <laughs> um no, as the car was driving across the bumpy field, the headlights never moved. The two headlights in the RV were not bouncing up and down as the vehicle went across the open plain as they expected it to, looking what? as though they were gliding across the ground instead. Like it had like perfect what? shocks, basically. Yes, like, like it was perfect just shocks, like, like just straight. But you said the vehicle was bouncing. Well, is it as it should be bouncing? Like, if As it was it driving, be it would be like... If it was driving, bum, bum, bum. yeah, it should be bouncing. Right, right. I thought what you were saying is the vehicle itself was bouncing, but the headlights were like... My bad. Perfectly fine. No, no, no. Yeah, no. The, the vehicle, as like, it should be bouncing, crazy. it looked like. Instead, it made it look like everything was driving, uh, gliding across the ground. And as they continued to chase, they realized the RV was completely ignoring their fencing throughout the property. And it just drove seemingly through all of their... Uh, fences and stuff that were standing in the way. We're talking about and, a ghost RV? And once they reached the wire fence and the olive trees, the lights of the RV lifted gently off the ground above the olive tree line and disappeared into the trees. After continuing to look for a few more moments, it eventually raised above the tree line and they could see the silhouette of the thing in the, in the sky. And they described it as simply, quote, oblong and refrigerator shape. Unquote. Like one of those uh, Mothman UFOs. Yeah, like a Tic Tac shaped UFO. Yeah. What? <sighs> Call him a long boy here on Chiluminati. <laughs> a Chilumalongi. Yeah, a Chilonganati. A Chilonganati. <laughs> Chilonganati. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. They, uh, I almost <laughs> called you Dave. You're not Dave. You're Jesse. Jesse. <laughs> Are you okay? He's acting like no, Dave. Okay. He's acting like yeah, Dave Gorman right is. now. He's he's a, you're being like a real Dave okay. Gorman right now, Jesse. Yeah, why are you got to be such a I'm Dave? I'm letting you dude? know. Uh, that sounds like bull patoots. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that they were like, we went out and we saw this thing that it, uh, it not only was it an RV, but when it started driving away, it looked like it was floating and went through fences and took off. And was a UFO. Okay, but There's why no would way. they have said that if it didn't happen? Right? <laughs> well, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> a Listen, lot of man, reasons. I'm just saying, like, they assumed it was an RV, probably because it was oblong-shaped and it maybe was just sitting on the ground. But what is being described is a typical, like... UFO. Uh, UFO. A typical Tic Tac UFO encounter. I don't like that. This typical. is like the monster a mash typical, of Chiluminati. A typical UFO. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. All yeah. right. They're all here. Yeah. They're all here, man. The They're big here. wolf, the small Tic Tac alien. Yeah, they're I hate still this. here. I hate where this is going. I know it's going to be like, and then Bigfoot showed up. And <laughs> well, then Bigfoot first episode. the Mothman was there. Mm -hmm. And then the aliens, they kidnapped people I there. Love and you, then Jesse. ghosts and the I, aliens. And I, only I say hate this. this. I hate this. I only say this to keep you interested. While you rattle off the Bigfoot and the Mothman... Those are legitimate this. sightings on Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> 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 and, and, uh, this we'll is not that. real. This is not a real thing. This uh, is the Mothman so sighting, made up. Uh, just very briefly, was they saw it, him in a tree and they flashed the light up at it and it screeched at them and spread it. <laughs> yeah, just very briefly, it was like, yeah, and that was it. Yeah, it, was yeah, no, it was. It was very much like, yeah. We'll talk about that. There's a little Mothman-shaped cloud behind. Yes, 
those types of sightings Bull do happen here. <laughs> shit. <laughs> this is not real. This is people trying to sell bad land in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And they're just like, there's aliens, and then idiots buy it. And now an idiot did buy it. No. And they have a TV an, show the with The Adamantium idiot. Corporation bought it, okay? Right, the Adamantium <laughs> Corporation bought it. Or the Adamantium really Group, was... or whatever they're called. <laughs> right, I'm such a fool. Adamantium Holdings? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, anyway. Needless to say, after this encounter with this bizarre RV UFO, Dave broke down crying and ended up leaving the ranch much earlier than he Wait, anticipated. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Ooh. You're telling me that with all the crazy stuff happening on this ranch, the one that got him crying was the RV that flew. He was like, this I can't take it Dave anymore. Encountered. This was he the was, only encounter. That was the Dave first encountered. thing he saw. He it went back home and he played. Thing, Dave is a little bitch. I'm going to say it. <laughs> Listen, Dave, Dave. I'm, not, I'm with Dave. you, dude. I'm with you. If I saw They that, got wolves that bite people's heads off. Like, <laughs> they got Bigfoots. They got ghosts. And you're over there like, a flying RV. <laughs> game over, man. <laughs> Get out of here. He Dave, went home and he beat the like... entire game of Mist in two days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he really did. That was more his speed. Yeah. Dave went on to go make point and click adventures for the rest of his he life. He was the first that. person in line to pick up a copy of Warcraft 1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um,. So Dave ended up going home much earlier, never truly became the ranch hand that, is, that the Gormans were hoping to make him. And his parents let the Gormans know that his son would no longer be visiting them on the ranch. Yeah, because he probably saw their BS and he was going to call them out on it. And they were like, take him out to the Snitches flying. get stitches, son. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take him out to the flying RV field. Flying RV. Um, <clears throat> just a few weeks. After Dave's encounter and Dave's departure, though, the Gormans would have another encounter with the RV lights. On yet another walk after sunset on their ranch, the family began to hear what sounded like man metal banging on metal. Wanting uh, robot sex. They were just robots fucking just in the middle of the field. It was like, pam, 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 pam. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they were like, damn, he's going hard. <laughs> the family curious went to investigate the sound to discover the same or at least very incredibly similar looking RV that Tom and Tad chased before uh, and then it flew off and, gave, and they gave up on was back. And after deciding to chase it again and to get it off of the property, it turned off its lights and vanished instead, not gliding away, just disappearing and then reappearing further away. They would then give chase. Like the it teleported? Would, the seemingly so. Okay. They would then give chase. The lights would go out. And then they would reappear elsewhere, further away. And it would do this for a while. Bizarrely intelligently toying with them. Dragging them across their own property. Not really allowing them to get too close. Before eventually just vanishing and then not reappearing for the night. Not to return for the rest of that night. It's like the opposite of the Monty Python gag. Where the guy's <laughs> running from the field. Yep. Every it time really they look, it's like farther. And it really did seem like this thing was intelligently playing with them. Like it was, it knew it was there and it was just toying with them. Tom was getting, beginning to get frustrated as these were very regular occurrences uh, around his property. And, uh, you know, understandably, he was also getting angry and a little nervous. How far in are they? Like into their like you're looking. We're at this point. We're like three or four months in. Okay. So like the really only a few months. So they're Remember, seeing they only shit lasted like thir 14 months or 15 months. It was. So, so they're seeing shit pretty much constantly. Constantly and all the time and almost right away. Like once a week plus and, and, and nightly. Big, what was it? But, and if it's like once a week, big things are happening. The small poltergeist activity is still happening all the while. Things are disappearing. Cabinets are opening. Like your typical poltergeist activity. And what's the what's the nightly? It was like nightly UFO sightings or something. The, the the these lights specifically, these RV lights. This is the beginning of what would be something that would be messing with him regularly for the rest of his stay on this ranch. That's these crazy. are the beginnings of the the regular UFO sightings. That's because he's harassing them. They just came he to camp out them. and they were like, he's "Get off our property!" And they're like, like "You get off my property! I don't care if you're damn alien." Like, and he just yeah, and so the them. aliens were like, all right. They were like, and they just <laughs> messed with them. <laughs> Getting so freaking annoyed with their these sonar? Yeah. They're <laughs> teleporting. It's there from the <laughs> Jetsons. Always. Gotcha. The Jetson teleporting. 
Two pings, Mr. Elliot. <laughs> Bong. <laughs> Bong. It's Sean Connery in there. Young Sean Connery right. is in there. He's just up in that in that spaceship. Yeah. Bong. Tom, obviously getting frustrated, angry, and a little nervous, because these events were happening constantly, and there had been no answers, only more questions, and seemingly more things were coming out to play with the family, toy with them, uh, frustrate them, and, and scare them. The animals, the, the and, and the lights, etc. I would be buying motion sensors. I would be buying turrets. I would be playing turret defense with my right? ranch. <laughs> Tom began to spend his nights outside from this point on trying to catch proof of these mysterious lights that he dubbed intruders. Even moving his cattle to a different part of the ranch because the lights began to mess with his cattle. They would appear in the middle of his cattle, raising up. He would hear his cattle begin to make noise, and so Tom would go to investigate. And lo and behold, there were the lights dancing around, causing chaos, and he would chase them off, trying to catch them. so insane to me. It is insane. He got so frustrated that he be- that he be- he actually moved the cattle to a different part of the ranch entirely for them to graze. And almost frustrated with his decision, the activity of the lights increased and began to annoy him and his They were family like trolling even- him? Yeah, and even more so. Being amongst the cattle, being out there in the field, he'd go chase them, they'd run away. The incidents were constant. If they weren't nightly, they at least seemed to be often enough to just get under his skin. And instead of being run off of his property, Tom just got more annoyed and would just chase them down even more. And he would just shout at them, try to get proof of them, pictures of them. But they, again, acted intelligently and just seemed like they wanted to fuck with them all. Jesse, how you doing over there? Uh, It's convenient that he couldn't get a photo, but please continue. It's hard, dude. They're lights. Come on. They're they like, can tell yeah. me. Right. Yeah, they're they're asshole lights, so, you know. He's a rancher, not a photographer. Give him some slack. <laughs> right? Goddamn. One particular winter, or what? Not, not one winter, the winter, that winter, after another night of being outside trying to catch these things in some way, Tom was on his way back to the house, failing to catch anything and having to deal with the aftermath of a blizzard anyway. The whole ranch was covered in snow, and that required a whole lot more work. But on his way back, Mr. Gorman saw something. Not the lights this time, but a craft, still. An aircraft, about 30 to 40 feet long, with short matte black wings, no more than 20 feet off the ground. The X-Men jet. The X-Men jet had arrived. (laughs) He also goes on to note that he doesn't believe he had seen it. uh, He doesn't believe that he he would have seen it were it not for the snow making a very clear outline on the ground to draw Like he thinks attention. it would have been undetectably stealth? Yeah, and he believes he would not have seen it if the snow wasn't there, like catching, you know, moonlight and stuff like that to show a shadow. The vehicle Tom describes seemed like a smaller hybrid of the F-117 and the B-2, but it made absolutely zero noise, which is strange because the F-117 is notably incredibly loud. I mean, even the B-2 is a fucking jet. That's also true. My mom works on that plane, actually. Oh, damn. That's yeah. cool. That's a, that's, a, that's a loud plane. Exactly. And this thing was 20 feet off the ground, making no noise whatsoever. Moreover, to separate it from those military-like flight uh, planes, it also had multicolored, da- uh, multicolored lights dancing in a recur- recurring pattern on the snow. Tom continues to say, Richard Richard Dreyfus is there. I don't, man, you guys are reference monsters and I'm just not. You haven't seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind? I have not. You, okay, you you of all people. the end of that movie? I know, I haven't seen it. Of all people, you just just do yourself a favor and like watch. I know that movie got like studied Project Blue Book and all this other stuff to make the movie. You would you would lose your mind. It's a pretty good. It's it's good. I I should watch it actually. I'll watch it this weekend. Yeah, actually, it's good. Uh, I'll I'll have a little bit of time. Um, Lucky, lucky you. You'd be like, and I can do it back to you. Then we can have our own conversation. I'm excited. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so it, it had multicolored lights dancing in a recurring pattern on the snow. And Tom then says that it looked like the craft's movements were slow and intentional, going back and forth over a small part of the land, what we now know as, again, Stealth Bomber Ridge. Ridge. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, sorry. And it seemed like, Tom said, 
that it was looking for something. So Tom went over, reached up, waved his hands, and made a whole bunch of noise to get its attention. And it seemed like, at the very least, it worked, because the lights went out and the ship slowly flew off, never adjusting at slow speed, however, and still never making any noise. Can I ask you a question? Like, real? T- you have to be real with me on oh, this. Oh, no. When we're done, uh-huh. will you at least have some attempted explanation of why this ridge is so important to all of these things? I think, uh, the, I think the devil is in the details there. Like, is there, there has to be a reason why. Why well, Skinwalker Ridge is famous? No, no. Why all these things go like are there to begin with? Well, right, if, right. If, it's, it's famous because all these things are there. But why are all these things there? It might be a reality flap. Yeah, flap. <laughs> we, <Jesus laughs> I forgot we this, about. We went this over bullshit. this last time. I forgot flap. about reality <laughs> flaps. I love you, Jesse. I promise. I thinning. forgot. I forgot. We had talked about reality <laughs> a flaps. Always, Jesse, always, Jesse. A thinning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At the end of uh, the last episode, as we always do, there will be the theory section. Everything from the best scientific theories we can we can muster to the absolutely insane nonsense that we also all. All right, look, look, I'm I'm waiting. I can't wait for that because that's Jesse, right now. All you're telling me is more reasons why I need to know Jesse, what, what is important do, do about this. Do you see this? this? Do you see this? This see is what this in the camera. Your hand. Yes, take my hand and trust me. <laughs> I am going to guide you through Skinwalker Ranch as your partner. And as your guy, I don't. Here's the thing: Incredible. you have to trust your partner, and I'm letting you know right now. <laughs> we are starting this relationship off from a bad foundation. Yes, we've been in this relationship for two years now, and you don't trust me, dude. I would fall uh, on Mathis for sure. Thank you. No, I'm like, no, I, uh, nah. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you know, I appreciate the honesty, Jesse. I appreciate the honesty. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. I feel like uh, you'd lead me into some, you know, like pet this wolf. It seems friendly with its blue eyes. No, I'm good. Okay, Dude, but you, you know, pet dire wolf. They ended up shooting. No. It, they ended up shooting it with four magnum bullets and and two uh, shot shot not shotgun a rifle bullets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you're telling me is. This once peaceful wolf that then was like, oh, I'm hungry. You then shot with a yeah. bunch of shells, yeah. and now you're like, well, it's it killing should be my fine. Cat. That thing won't come back for vengeance. Get out of town. <laughs> I, if I was there, it'd come for me too. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Jesse the succulent calf. I'm back there with the mom just like, oh, hell no. Yeah, yeah what are you doing? Oh, mm-hmm. my God. Uh, hilariously enough, after that ship went away, it seemed like Tom was starting to get used to all of this. All the tone that I could get from Tom reading was just exasperation and frustration. He just wanted to get back to on. ranch in his couch. He just wanted to goddamn ranch, dude. He just wanted to ranch. This is a simple guy we're talking about here, Tom Exactly, Gorman. a simple great rancher. And to top it off, Mrs. Gorman would also have an encounter with a similar type of ship. Ellen says that she was driving home from work as she used to do. Uh, when she saw the ship that we just described outside of her car window. She sped home, clearly upset at seeing something, calling for Tom about what... And then she went to the phone, sorry, and called Tom to tell her about what she had just uh, encountered. Tom was out on business doing, I guess you would assume, like selling cattle and calves on town and whatnot. And Tom had to calm her down and get her inside, eventually getting home and helping calm her down. When Mrs. Gorman then described what she'd saw, it was reminiscent of the of the ship that we that uh, Tom had seen the a few days prior. Sorry, I'm losing track of where I'm reading for some reason. I'm like losing my. It's it's late. It's late. Yeah, all right? it's Give late. Me, bear with me here. It's the witching hour. The perfect time. It to is the witching hour. Uh, as Tom started to calm her down, what would appear outside in their field, other than the two lights belonging to the quote RV unquote? Ellen was incredibly confused as the only way onto the ranch and to get to where she was seeing the lights would have been to come past the house. But she saw nothing, and these lights simply appeared. Worse yet, and something to tie into something else that we've discussed, a figure then appeared. In the house? No, no, at the RV. Oh, okay. Because it was still somewhat light out, and Ellen could see the RV had a desk attached to the side of it. 
in some way. What? What do you mean? What? A good question. Like a bunk a, bed that like, has like a desk no, like underneath? A desk, like a desk. Like she could see a desk on the west, uh, like a, a brightly lit RV with a desk on it, in it, or on it. it would, like just like a like desk. Like a wooden office desk. Yes, like an office desk. What? She saw the, a figure come into view, sit at the desk for a little while. Uh -huh. Before rising and heading to the door of the house. As it got closer, Mrs. Can you Gorman. Imagine, can you imagine this alien's just like, he goes to the desk, he's filling out paperwork, <laughs> and he's just like, oh, god damn it, I gotta go over to see these people. Can't even believe this shit. All these forms for me. All right. And he's just like going through the paperwork, and he stands up and he's like, Let's get this over with. It starts marching down. <laughs> I know I'm gonna that's scare the what shit happened. out of these motherfuckers. Like, it's like monsters. Hi, eat. Mrs. Gorman. We're here to perform a survey on the abduction haunting scenarios that we pers uh, we gave you the past few months. If you just go through this questionnaire with me, the most powerful source of alien energy is the screams of human beings. <laughs> Actually, if you want an actual answer, it's organ energy, which we as emotional beings with souls are able to create, and that's why our planet is so valuable to harvest for the aliens. I just knocked over. Organ? Organ energy. Organ energy. Why does it sound you like it's in calisthenics? Mind. Look it up. O-R-G-O-N-E. I mean organ Dianetics, energy. not calisthenics. You are what the fuck at am the I saying? Speed of thought right now. Dude, <laughs> I <laughs> totally am. You are. No, no. Uh, out of you know, time out. We, I'm just we're a silver beam, end. baby. I know we're getting towards the end of the episode, but just Google <laughs> organ energy. I'm going to do or it for you. Organ or Energy or like Oregon, like Oregon, O R G O N E, Oregon it also Trail, is the secret of the pyramids and why the Egyptians created pyramids because it helps Stop. harness the energy. No, it's not the Oregon. No, it's oh, not. it's like it's like a 1950s product. Oh no, uh, Oregon energy is a pseudo scientific concept variously described as an esoteric energy or hypothetical universal life force. Okay, so wait, so how come? Yeah, right. How come on the Wikipedia page when I look it up, the the picture is of a chamber made of wood with a like a I don't know. Cushion well, chair an, inside well, of it. An, well, that's an organ energy accumulator, dude. You go in there. So you sit in there and you just get sit. right? Yes, correct. You correct. Get, you get small, you know? <laughs> Alternating layers of organic and non-organic materials inside the wall supposedly increase the organ concentration inside the enclosure relative to the oh, surrounding the environment. organs, yeah. It yeah, looks like if John Proctor did, like, sensory deprivation training. Like, it, it looks <laughs> fucked up. That's what the aliens want, dude. They want our organ energy. Anyway. Back to the Get episode. out of there, Tinjima! Get out of there! <laughs> <laughs> Go, uh, Tinjima! The aliens! <laughs> oh God! Get in no, the de no. hide behind the desk! <laughs> Meanwhile, oh, fuck. <laughs> As this this figure walked up to the door and came into better view, Mrs. Gorman could actually see the thing a little better. It was she Daniel says, Day Lewis. Oh, no. <laughs> she says this person was seven feet tall, wearing all black. It's not um, a man in black. This is bullshit. It is. Exactly. This, <laughs> this is bullshit. A man There's in no black. way. There's no uh, way. Uh, he was wearing a visor and knee-high boots. A visor like an 80s like Cyberman visor that, or like that, a like poker I mean, player's like a, visor? Yeah, like a hat visor, which is also there. That has also been seen in Men in Black Encounters because they don't understand fashion particularly well. Like uh, a gambling visor. Yeah, like a gambling visor. Will Smith made it look good. That's true. That's true. I was wrong. At this point, she had only called her husband on the phone, and he had calmed her down over the phone. However, when this uh, figure so arrived... So she was alone there yeah. when this guy rolled so when, up and was like, hey. When the figure arrived, she panicked, and he dropped what he was doing and drove all night to get home by the time uh, to get home to take care of okay, his Okay, yes, and what happened? The figure eventually left, and the RV lights dissipated. She never answered the door and never interacted with it. She just ignored it. What a Whew. cop out. The following morning, the two of them went to where she believes she saw the RV lights, and she saw footprints in the mud, about 18 inches long, a prominently round heel, but no discernible boot marks, which is curious, as she certainly saw boots. And while that is only the beginnings of the interactions and encounters the Gorman family had on Skinwalker Ranch, more giant cryptids, a psychic who comes to hang out in the field and reach out to aliens and other ghost-like activities are still yet to be spoken about Shut here up. on Skinwalker Ranch. Shut <laughs> And up. I am not kidding you a single bit. Obviously, we also have to talk about their cattle. 
the storms that would happen and the missing cattle that would go, as well as the mutilations that happened on their ranch. There's so much more to cover. This is, without a doubt, going to be our longest series at easily four episodes. I, you know what? It's easy to make four episodes when you can just bullshit the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the men in black. Literally everything we've talked about, you're like, yeah, and then they showed up too. This is nonsense. The best you part is that you're people. starting to like recognize their calling cards. Yeah, you, you really can't. are starting to understand. You were you called it Men in Black before I said it was like, Men in Black. Don't say it's the Men in Black. And it's like, <laughs> it was. And you were like, get out of here. <laughs> you're starting to learn, Jesse. But you got to oh. keep in mind, too. This is what's so strange about this place. This is what makes Skinwalker Ranch so unique. Everything seems to happen here. Everything. But and why there and not like Fort Lauderdale? Well, right? like, why would all these animals Why would it be in Fort Lauderdale? But in, to, uh, to, to answer your question. Is that an prices? Oregon depository? <laughs> to I don't answer know, your question, like... though, it's not just the family that had experiences here, and that's going to be all about episode four, probably, at this pace. No, I'm saying I. Why? I'm, I don't right, know. I'm accepting the premise that everything goes there. Yeah, but why? I but don't again, know. why there? What is so specific we'll get, about we'll get that? There for You're sure. saying we Oregon get there. energy? We'll, we'll get there get, for sure. No, no, no. I'm not actually saying no, no, like no, 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 Oregon no. energy. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. No, we'll get to the theories. I can't spoil you, Jesse. If the you aliens just... wanted Oregon energy, they would just get in a wooden closet with a chair in it, and it would right. And they would just this. They would just at the end of this, the whole thing is like they're all aliens. Don't you get it? The the wolf, the men in black, the Bigfoots, the, they're all aliens. I will tell you this. And without this wrecking is... Mathis's like, plot reveal, I have heard theories about this very thing you're asking about. So I yep. will say that. Okay. There's so all many right. good theories. I'm hanging in there. How? how <laughs> I'm sorry, but Jesse, we're just going to – basically, I'm putting a doorstop on the open door to your mind, and I'm not just going to – I can't let it close oh, right shit. now. Oh, shit. It's going to stay open for at least another two episodes. So let it feel – Feel the information flow into that open Yeah, no, door. the river's flowing. See what's through. Fish are laying the scary eggs. Door. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Thank you for coming along with me on this ride, boys. This is going to be I'm so jacked. fun. I'm jacked. We're at the bare minimum halfway, but maybe more. We'll I'm see. jacked. Like a man-sized wolf. <laughs> it's I'm a man-sized wolf. I'm as jacked as a father <laughs> yelling for his 30-06 rifle. <laughs> Tad, Tad, get me my rifle. Tad, I'm about to snipe this wolf up close. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. If you guys enjoyed it, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Chiluminati Podcast as we continue to explore Skinwalker Ranch. And we'll have a mini-sode for all you people who want to go above and beyond and who have been supporting us over on Patreon right now. Right after There's this. There's a mini-sode. What did you think of the mini-sode compilation? That was good, right? That's what, right. You, that's what you get. You get yeah, one of those get. every time. Patreon.com slash Chiluminati Pod crazy and also people who want merch we still got hats shirts all that good stuff over on the yeti go check it out yeti.com and you just uh, search for chaluminati and it'll pop right on up and as always if you just are enjoying listening dropping us a review uh, is always a good way to show your support as well if you want to reach us our socials are math this games for myself Fasiane a for alex jesse cox for jesse and chaluminati pod for the podcast and the subreddit goes by the same name chaluminati pod you can drop your stories and if you are part of the patreon make sure you jump into the discord there's like a huge community over there. They've got community game nights going on. They've got a community book club going on over there and a bunch of other stuff. It's all that. Crazy. All that all and that more at the Patreon. And more at our Patreon. We're going to go. We'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, Peace. everybody. Bye.